So we're continuing our discussion of DNA for forensic science students, and now we've reviewed what DNA is and where it comes from. So let's talk about it in terms of forensic investigations. So what are some sources of biological evidence? Well, you can probably think of a few, and there are some common ones that come up when we're talking about crime scenes, but really what we're talking about is things like um, blood, semen, saliva, urine, hair, teeth, bone, body tissues. These are all potential sources or places we can get biological evidence. And provided that they all come from the same individual, the information you would get from all of them would be identical. Now, where can we find these types of evidence at a crime scene? Well, there are lots of specific places we might look. Um, blood stains, semen stains, Chewing gum is actually an excellent source because you get saliva and cheek cells stuck in there. Stamps and envelopes when people lick them. Plant materials. Plant materials oftentimes get overlooked because sometimes a plant and the specific variety of plant um, could be a vital piece of information when we're trying to link a suspect to a specific location. Sweaty clothing is another source, bone fragments, hair, uh, fingernail scrapings. If we've had a case of a violent fight or a sexual assault, um, oftentimes the victim will um, have their fingernails scraped underneath the nails in order to obtain any body tissues from the aggressor. Other sources of DNA might be things like saliva or animal materials like hair and even animal feces, believe it or not, could be a source of DNA evidence. Let's say that our assailant or a criminal walked through some animal feces on their way into a crime scene and tracked it through. We could potentially match that animal poop to the animal it came from and perhaps come up with a location or an owner or a link. Now, when we are identifying DNA evidence and where we can find it, there's lots of places that it can be. Some other things that we might look at are the handles on weapons where someone was holding it, or the inside of a hat, or the nose piece, or ear pieces on a pair of eyeglasses. Um, you can get pretty creative when you're trying to find DNA evidence at a crime scene. Um, bite marks um, and on the the outside surfaces of bullets actually that have been used. These are all potential places where one can find DNA evidence. So what do we do with that DNA once we have it? Well, we have to isolate it. So you've got these cells, blood, hair roots, saliva, sweat, body tissues, what have you. And you need to get the DNA out of them. What do you do? Well, first you collect your sample. Then we are going to add some chemicals to that. Now the chemicals we use are usually a mix of enzymes that will cause those cells to open up or rupture and it will place um, the DNA in a position where it can be collected. So we add our chemicals, these are usually enzymes. This then breaks open the cells and it releases the DNA for analysis. So the DNA comes out so it can be analyzed. You can't analyze the DNA if you don't first remove it from the cells and isolate it. So that's the only thing we are looking at. So now let's say that we have a sexual assault investigation specifically, and we need to isolate DNA from evidence from that scene in such a way that we can separate the DNA of the victim from the DNA of the assailant. Um, there once was a time where this was virtually impossible, but now there is a technique called differential isolation that allows us to separate the male from female fractions of a collected sample. So let's say we have a semen stain from a sexual assault investigation. First thing we do is we collect that same stain, we treat it with a chemical, that first removes epithelial DNA specifically. Now epithelial refers to skin cells. So this primarily targets cells that are skin cells and releases the DNA from those skin cells. This would most usually be the DNA from our victim. Then we take the remaining sample, 
we treat it again with a second chemical, a second enzyme, and this releases the sperm DNA. And this would largely create a situation where we can take one sample of mixed DNA from two individuals and separate the skin cell DNA or epithelial DNA from the sperm cell DNA and have two DNA profiles available to us, one from the assailant and one from the victim. And one of the problems with DNA is that there's not a lot of it in individual cells. So sometimes we have to go through a process called amplification. Amplification literally means we are going to take our DNA and we are going to make copies of it because DNA is small and we usually get very small amounts of it for analysis. So it's necessary to make more and we do that through amplification. And we use a process called PCR or the polymerase chain reaction. And we take our sample, we add a solution to it that um, creates a buffer for the DNA and we put it into this machine you see on the right. And this is an older PCR machine. Um, they've become increasingly sophisticated, but this is really about the size of an old-fashioned typewriter, and it can make millions of copies of an original piece of DNA. So how does it do that? How do you make copies of DNA? I mean, you can't exactly go to the Xerox machine and, and pop it on there and just start running off copies. Well, the process we use mimics the process that's done by your own cells when they go through mitosis or when they make copies of themselves. So there's three basic steps, denature, anneal, and extend, and I'm going to go through each one. So in denaturing, this is step one of a single cycle. So we take our double-stranded piece of DNA and we're going to expose it to heat. Heat is something that proteins and DNA and things like that just hate. Heat makes things break down. So in exposing it to heat and some chemicals, um, you end up with our double-stranded piece of DNA separating into two individual strands. And this is exactly the same thing that happens in your cells during cell division, but it's part of that natural process. We're not having to force it to happen along. So we add heat, and it separates our double-stranded piece of DNA into two strands. The next step is called anneal. And to anneal means literally to attach or to glue. And this is our second step. So we have our single-stranded piece of DNA, and to that we're going to add a small primer. This small primer matches the beginning sequence of our piece of DNA. In this case, TCTATC gets matched to AGATAG. By doing this, we kind of give it a place for the process to start. It's like starting off our pattern or giving a kickstart to a kid learning to ride a bike. So this is our second step. Annealing is attaching a matching primer so we can begin to copy our piece of DNA. The last step is to extend. And by extending, you might imagine, yeah, we're going to finish making that copy. So here's our single-stranded piece of DNA. Here's that primer we saw in the last step. And what we will do now is we will expose this primed piece of DNA that's ready to be copied to a soup of free nucleotides, just a whole bunch of adenines, guanines, thymines, and cytosines that are all just floating around in exactly the right conditions for this DNA to replicate or to copy itself. So as this happens, these individual bases come in and attach where they match, and we use a, an enzyme called DNA helicase that will help to extend that line of DNA. So we end up with a double-stranded piece of DNA that's exactly the same as the double-stranded piece we started with. So what is the result of this? Well, if we do enough amplification, you can get lots and lots of copies. So our first piece, after one cycle, we just get two copies, and then that goes to four, and then that goes to eight, and that goes to 16, and so on. Oftentimes, we run up to 28 cycles, and this can make millions of copies of DNA. 
What happens to that DNA once it's amplified? Well, then we can take it, we can sequence it, and that's what we're going to be talking about in our next video.